Ooh, Mioni here and welcome back to another news video for Final Fantasy XIV. This is actually an article posted on the 26th of September. It's taken until today, the 29th, for me to find time to read through this. And I thought we'd read through it together because it's quite interesting, as is always the case with interviews with Naoki Yoshida, the producer and director for Final Fantasy XIV. This one is over on Eurogamer, so of course there'll be a link to this at the top of the description. Go give that some love. I know that... Uh, a lot of people don't do that, so please go and give some love to the original poster. It does actually help their demographics as well. So thank you very much to uh, Ed Nightingale, uh, news reporter for Eurogamer, for this lovely interview that's been posted in the public domain. So let's uh, have a look through this. So of course, uh, the intro here, obviously with a producer and director, uh, talking about 6.2 Buried Memory, which has recently come out, and uh, we've all pretty much enjoyed it. I'm, I'm fairly confident in saying that. So Yoshi P says, My idea of the ultimate MMORPG is one in which each player playing the game can pick and choose the content they want to play and the developers take into account the myriad values held by the players, responding to as many requests as possible. So what I mean to say is the game will further develop if it can meet the needs of the players. Oh, of many players, sorry. Not just the needs of a particular type of player. In my eyes, the ultimate ideal is not playing all the game content, but being able to choose what content you want to play. How much of each type of content to implement is determined through discussions among the core staff, including myself as director, the assistant director, the content director, the battle director, and so on. Having said that, at the end of the day, it boils down to making a judgment based on what we feel would be appropriate. So we will release the content and then iteratively make adjustments while keeping an eye on the player feedback. End quote. So, yeah, that's that's how I imagined they would address a lot of the things in the game. It's kind of going to come down to a bit of a balance, isn't it? Where, you know, you don't want to put, like, all the PvP features in one patch with, like, loads of maps and content and then leave the rest of the game without it. They often talk about budgeting for patches, um, at least I've seen in previous interviews and, and mentions of this. Um, so that's another constraint. So it, it basically is all picked and choosed. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in terms of creations of ideas, but a lot of those only come to fruition in certain patches because of the, the balance of content and trying to give everybody a different avenue. And that's that's pretty much how it should be I, i'm pretty sure um honestly yeah I, I think that's how it should be so final fantasy 14 has proven to be incredibly popular with the fan base um it's clearly important to diversify content and provide something for everyone ah so we're going to be talking about the duty support system and uh, the ability to complete duty solo um, Yoshi P says, the main point is not that we're focusing exclusively on single player content in particular, but rather that the scale of the game, its content and development has finally grown to the extent that we can provide content tailored to solo players. Another reason is that in further developing Final Fantasy XIV and expanding its scale, I want to guide people who have been thinking that connecting with other players is a pain in MMORPGs, so that ultimately they'll come to appreciate the fun playing with others. As an entry point into the game, being able to play the main scenario solo is a huge plus. Yeah, I would agree completely with that. A lot of people see it um, quite negatively uh, that I've talked to. Um, surprisingly, they see uh, the, the fear of the game uh, becoming a single player sort of experience and they also uh, associate that with the, the winding down of the content supposedly I don't know how they get that but some people do have a fear that um, it's essentially what they did with 11 where the player base was thinning so they had to implement the trust system it totally is completely the opposite with this uh, you know final fantasy 14 is growing at an exponential rate and the content is very much um, you know, reflective of that. They have a much bigger budget and a much wider scope of what they're doing. If you haven't noticed that, then I don't know what rock you might have been living under. But at the same time, 
it is important to get people to that content. And the best way to do that is to limit the amount of reliability um, there is on players who perhaps don't want to do some of the earlier stuff in the game, especially for the, the storyline. Some of it is, frankly, irritating, which is why Steps of Faith, for example, got turned into a solo duty, um, amongst many other things. And, um, you know, the simplification of certain mechanics in other places or the visualization updates. So it is it does make sense, really, to, to sort of help people along on that journey. And Yoshi P is right. Presumably they will get to that end part and start, you know, appreciating other players a lot more in the more current content. And as a natural evolution of this, obviously the topic comes up about Island Sanctuary as a further extension of this diversification of content. Yoshi P says, I wanted to provide a place where players could leisurely spend their time without participating in battles. It was also our aim to cover the needs that housing could not, such as letting one's minions roam free and expanding the area available to players. Eventually, as I was thinking about these things, a popular Japanese TV show ended, giving me the idea of the island concept, and the content took shape as you see it today, at which point he was laughing about this. So there you go. Island Sanctuary came from the idea of a Japanese TV show. I'd love to know which one that was and uh, to go and watch it. But uh, yeah, well, there you go. Yoshi P says, where possible, I did want this content available to players at early levels in the game, but I considered that in the current story we've reached an opportune moment and we're now in the position to provide such an island to our hero. Hence, in the end, I had no choice but to make Clearing 6.0 one condition to access the content. You see, these types of things are tied to the fact that we're extremely particular about Final Fantasy XIV's story, says Yoshida. So essentially, the reason that it's locked behind the 6.0 storyline for, for one point is, you know, predominantly a storyline reason. I mean, it does make sense if you consider the downtime that the Warrior of Light is essentially um, receiving at this point in the storyline. But at the same time, there's quite a lot going on as well in the next chapter of storyline. So it's kind of... It's bizarre to me, but um, yeah, obviously they wanted to make it like a little flagship reward for your hard earned, um, you know, your journey basically up to this point. Next, they talk about content added to the game and it, how difficult it must be to please everyone and, um, you know, how expansions influence that. Yoshi P says, I'm not sure about Final Fantasy XIV becoming so big it doesn't quite satisfy everyone. The larger the game becomes, the more content should be available to suit player preferences. Hence, in my opinion, any growth in the game's scale is basically of benefit to the players, and there's nothing bad that will come out of it, end quote. So, yeah, the way that they see it internally is the bigger the game gets, the more people it reaches, the more people that, um, you know, they're not going to necessarily try to satisfy everyone, um, but, uh, you know, they're increasing paying attention to what content's going out when, does offer a, a diversity, you know, a diversified array of content to suit the majority of people. So I think that, honestly, from a development stand, you, you can't really argue with that. Obviously, patches are limited to what they can contain within them. So there might be content that's saved for later patches. For example, 6.25 is bringing the Relics uh, Criterion on variant dungeons, um, the new tribal quest with the Omicrons, things like that. It just would have been just almost impossible um, for a player to really have that content at the same time as 6.2, considering what was involved in that. Uh, there'd be far too much, um, you know, PvE-related content, especially with a PvP season and PvP series, as well as everything else. It would have been probably a little bit much. So I actually personally... When I read this, I agree with the idea of spacing things out a little bit, especially with those minor patches as well. I'm really looking forward to 6.25. It might be one of the most exciting 0.25 patches I've ever looked forward to. And finally, <laughs> they ask, Yoshida was particularly taken with the stream. They're talking about the um, Mogshoot farm. 
which of course was the before the island sanctuary launch they talked about um, a real life farm and they they broadcast an entire week of that and it was quite interesting um you know people watching named one of the roosters xenos and uh, i believe the, the farm themselves took uh took note of this and they actually renamed said chicken to xenos as well which was rather entertaining um but yeah they asked about this and yoshi p says i'll avoid giving any definite answer about whether or not xenos the chicken will make an appearance in the game but i can say that the stream had turned out to be a great source of stimulation for thinking up future rewards end quote and that's the end of the, the of the whole thing so xenos the chicken minion is that a possibility? I don't know. I think a lot of people would love a Xenos the Chicken mount, but um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's nice to know that they, they take inspiration from things like this, so they're going to have like that really stimulating, nice and calming live stream, and have, t have paid attention to probably how you know creatures move and and how they behave. So and, and you know obviously fan reception of that was exceptional. People needed that I think at this sort of point in life. Uh, you know these last few years have been absolutely horrible for a lot of people. So having something calming on the main channel of fourteen was was quite nice actually. <laughs> it was quite nice. I enjoyed that. Um, but yeah, Xenos the chicken has not seen his final day, and I'm sure he will be back. Anyway, thank you so much um, to obviously Ed Nightingale for this. It's always nice to have little interviews. There wasn't a, a terribly large amount of you know content to be had from this. That wasn't the intention of said uh, interview. It was talking about solo in a multiplayer world. It was well answered, honestly, well asked and well answered. Um, many of which we probably already knew the, the you know the how they planned around things, but it was. You know, it's always nice to know and to check in how they they see the future of 14 and uh, build those blocks together. Anyway, hopefully this has been helpful for people who are on the move and perhaps can't, uh, you know, obviously read this. It's, it's it's an interesting read. Give it a like if you can or whatever whatever they have on websites these days. Give it a hit. That's what they say, isn't it? Go and, go and support it. And there's a support Eurogamer thing if you wish to as well. Anyway, thank you so much for watching today's video. I will be back with more content. And I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.